Hello and welcome to the Consistency Project with E.C. Sinkowski. My name is Patrick Cummings, and every episode I have the privilege of having a discussion with E.C. on subject matters that range from nutrition to fitness to the choices we can all make to live a healthier, more functional life. By exploring both the principles at play and the actions worth carrying out as a result, it's our goal to get you thinking, get you moving, and get you taking more consistent steps for optimizing your well-being. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. As always, how are you, E.C.? Good. Wondrous. We are going to return to our hotcakes. Hot cakes is when I make you talk about random things on the internet that are that have <laughs> piqued my curiosity. Perfect. <laughs> so uh, how this tends to work for folks who are new is about 24 hours before you and I get uh, on the interwebs and record this, I send you three articles or three things I found um, from the internet. Just uh, and then we just talk through it. I get mm-hmm. your thoughts on kind of what's going on, things to think about. Maybe they're absurd. Maybe they're interesting. Maybe they're somewhere in between. So we've got no three. We've got, yeah. No PubMed. No research. PubMed. That is exactly <laughs> PubMed free. So we've got um, three things today. As I mentioned, we've got something about uh, taking a pill instead of exercising. Mm-hmm. We've got uh, chocolate milk in schools. And we've got uh, something on Wonder Bread and mm-hmm. how it perhaps at one point helped eliminate some diseases. Okay. So we're going to do uh, in that order. This is an article um, called Scientists Say They're Honing In on a Pill You Can Take Instead of Exercising. I'm just going to do a quick debrief of what's in this article and then kind of get your first thoughts on it. Mm. Uh, and this is from one of the co-authors of the paper. He says, if we can understand the mechanism by which exercise triggers these benefits, uh, then we are closer to helping many people improve their health. And then what's perhaps a little bit more useful is the press release that they put out, which says they have identified a molecule in the blood that is producing uh, that is produced during exercise and can effectively reduce food intake and obesity in mice. And uh, the researcher conducted comprehensive analysis on blood blood plasma, excuse me, Mm -hmm. compounds from mice following intense treadmill running. The most significantly induced molecule is a modified amino acid called LACFE, uh, L-A-C-F-P-H-E, synthesized from lactate. um, And I'm not going to pronounce this right at all. Phenylalanine. Phenylalanine, yeah. See, that's where we have you here, which is an amino acid that is one of the building blocks of protein. In mice uh, with diet-induced obesity, uh, they were fed a high-fat diet. A high dose of LACFI suppressed food intake by about 50% compared to control mice over a period of 12 hours without affecting their movement or energy expenditure when administered mm-hmm. to the uh, to the mice for 10 days. LACFI uh, reduced cumulative food intake and body weight owning, uh, owning, owing to loss of body fat and improved glucose tolerance. Okay. That's enough of reading. Uh, so thoughts, I mean, this is on mice, which we've talked about before, but, uh, are we going to get close to, uh, exercise in a pill? Mm. Yeah. I have a few different thoughts. Um, probably the first one is, you know, this, this may surprise people. Um, it's actually come up a couple times recently for me in my master class. but if there was a pill that we could take that really did give us all of the same benefits of eating a whole unprocessed food diet and exercise, I would be all for it. Mm. Like I'm not for doing all of the hard work because of doing the hard work I'm Mm -hmm. doing. I'm for the doing of the hard work because of the outcome it delivers. (laughs) And so I just like to point that out because I always like to remind people that we can't be so tied to our ideas over outcomes. We have to look at the outcome and be like, okay, if this is a better outcome, then I'm going to switch my method because of it. And so that's sort of my first thought is I think um, it's just good to always think about that and be like, okay, let me challenge my beliefs. And is this really a better outcome? But, you know, that, that does lead into then kind of the next point where it's like, I don't think that this will be a better outcome. Mm, (laughs) (laughs) It it may in fact reduce appetite and, um, also help with weight loss, which could be very similar to the semaglutide drug that we talked about quasi recently. Right. And maybe it will help people with that. And that can have some huge benefits on just overall health and quality of life for sure. But it then also just sort of assumes that the benefits of exercise are only because of weight loss. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, no, (laughs) no, 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 no. I mean, you know, functionality in life, just being able to obviously move around and pick things up in life and the strength required for that. Um, some of it's just the coordination that you need. Some of it's just the mental stimulation. Maybe it's even through, you know, playing new sports coordination. Heck, let's throw in social aspects about getting out and being active. So, 
I think, again, this is where we always have to remember that it's never one thing, right? And that the benefit of exercise is not just about weight loss. And that maybe there could be a role, just like there is for semaglutide in some cases to help with appetite and drive those outcomes. But I'm not yet convinced that this will really replace all the benefits that exist for exercise. Yeah, it's interesting because obviously the first thing I thought about when we were when I was when I kind of came across this and sent it to you is is what we had talked about with semaglutide and and uh, and what seems like and I haven't really followed whatever news may come out from that, but it doesn't seem like it's gone backwards. Right? It doesn't feel like or it doesn't seem like like oh no, we were wrong. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. do the thing. Like it only actually seems like it's increasing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I even think that I think Weight Watchers like bought a company that was making a similar one, mm. a similar uh, maybe they're using the same drug but, or sure. the same compound. Um, but my point being is like, I'm what what was interesting to me is like, are we moving into a time? And there's a weird parallel with AI where it feels mm. like we're we're about to make. Or, the question is, are we about to make this giant leap forward in understanding? And maybe it is just weight loss, but there's kind of this like this serious step change forward of what we, you know, between what we can do now and what we used to be able to do or what we couldn't do before mm-hmm. in the same way that AI is now, whether it's, we'll see where that goes as well, but like, it's, it's like, a it, it's a, it's just so much beyond and so much different that we actually don't really get it yet. Mm, mm -hmm. And so I'm just, I guess maybe to ask a question, which is like, does it feel like we might be getting towards a place where we're going to start making those sort of like really big leaps forward in understanding and an application of things like this? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. I'm certainly the researchers actually doing the work on the front lines about these appetite suppressing drugs are going to have a better idea if we're you know, on, on the curve up or more like a slow, steady climb, but certainly it feels that way. And I think, you know, the more I think about it, the more I think that something like an appetite suppressing drug is actually one of the better ways to handle, um, some of the problems that we're fighting with chronic obesity epidemic, not, okay. I want to make sure that the audience understands, not from the standpoint that I don't think diet and exercise is, um, awesome, powerful. Let's keep doing it. Want everyone to do it. Like, of course, that's still I want that part of the equation, but like compared to trying to regulate the food space, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like when we think about different alternatives and that's often one that's put out there and I'm still meaning to put together a podcast on that kind of about, you know, sugar tax and what's been done. And that's a quagmire, man, (laughs) that is hard, hard to figure out because we all know that we can have some level of these foods in our diet, as we've talked about before. I don't, how are you going to regulate how much cake somebody eats? I'd love to know, like, mm-hmm. really, like, mm-hmm. how are we going to do this? How are we going to pull this off? So, you know, it's interesting. It's like, maybe, maybe this is going to be the best solution, right? To help people deal and navigate with a modern food environment from a control point. Yeah. Besides, maybe- of course, all of the stuff we talk, I want to always ma- mention right. that, like, I right. like diet and exercise. Believe me, I'm, <laughs> we're not getting rid of vegetables. <laughs> no, anyway. I'm preaching that every day. I'm still yeah. there. <laughs> but what's interesting to your point, which I think is a is a really uh, a, a stew one, which is like, okay, that's not the entire point of exercise. It's not mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. weight loss. It's no. it's why I think a lot of people try, you know, end up going like fine. But what's interesting, what uh, to by what you just said is that it might maybe this is the way we bring people to a place where now exercise. Mm-hmm. And and more sustainable lifestyle changes are within reach, within mm-hmm. grasp, right? Because you've talked about before, like maybe not everybody is, maybe not fruits and vegetables and a barbell for everybody. It just might mm-hmm. not be the solution for everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it could be that things like this, whether it's this particular thing or the or the semaglutide, might get them to a place where they think, okay, now I feel capable. Mm-hmm to go do those other things that maybe I either literally couldn't do Mm -hmm. or I was scared to do. I didn't know how to do. I felt like I didn't belong there. Mm -hmm. And maybe that becomes, you know, and effectively what we're doing is bringing people back to the middle Mm -hmm. so they can kind of go off on, on another track. Totally. But without bringing them back to the middle, they, I mean, it may just not be possible. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think we talked about some of the weight loss that people are experiencing on semaglutide is 20%. So if you think about that, um, sure, people are going to want to just have this higher quality of life and mobility. I mean, I would imagine that if you lost, you know, 20%, you're more likely to want to go on the hike or 
play pickleball or you, you fill in the blank with whatever it is. And so that's a really interesting point as well. I mean, maybe it actually is a way to encourage people and to, to show them that diet and exercise can also be part of their regular, you know, routine as well. Cool. Okay. Let's jump into the next one. This is about, uh, this is, I think this is back in February. So I should have okay. looked at an update, but let's just go with it. Cause it'll be close enough, yeah. which is the article is just, uh, Republicans propose, uh, forcing schools to provide chocolate milk to children. A little bit from the article is a New York Republican representative has introduced a bill that would make it federal law for schools to provide chocolate milk in a broadside against supposed plans by New York City uh, Mayor Eric Adams to ban it over health concerns. And then just a little bit more. Uh, Washington banned chocolate milk from school cafeterias over a decade ago, as did LA in 2011, before partially reversing it in 2016. San, Fra uh, San Francisco banned chocolate milk in 2017, as have other school districts around the country. However, However, the issue of milk consumption is more acute in New York State, where dairy farming uh, constitutes the state's largest agricultural section, uh, sector, according to 22 report by the uh, Department of Agriculture and Markets. So mostly just thinking about this, taking the politics out because yes. who cares about that? Um, but mostly just this conversation around chocolate milk and schools and kids and is the answer to sort of ban things, <laughs> is the answer to... Uh, be highly regulated as to what goes into that school in the first place. And then sub question is like, why, why milk? Like, why is this the thing? But pizza seems to be fine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and chicken nuggets seem to be fine. Like, I'm just curious, like, is there, do you have any insight as to why milk is the, is kind of a target here? Yeah, I don't know. I actually should have gone to see like, what was the the reason for the banning, which, um, you know, we try not to put in too much research to this. It's more of just a <laughs> chat, but yeah, I mean, you know, we said we weren't going to get into politics, and I certainly don't want to get into from that standpoint, but I think this is a almost a perfect follow-up to what we just said. Like, guys, this is what happens when we try to regulate food. Mm, it yep. comes down to these really, like, what are we deciding between, you know? And just yep. like you said, like, pizza's probably allowed, but milk isn't. I mean, what are we talking about here, you yeah, know? Right. And then you have these non-experts who are sort of fighting over it based on their beliefs about understanding of nutrition, and I... It's like, oh my God, this is what we're spending our time on, chocolate milk or not. And I guess the replacement is vegan juice. And at the same, I guess at the same time, it's like, well, is that that bad too? You know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there is, really yeah, there is an argument the in there. Yeah. Cause right. I think, uh, uh, mayor Adams is a vegan. So I think that there was something in mm. there about, he wants to replace, uh, our, our chocolate milk with vegan juice. I don't even know like what's vegan. Isn't juice. Right. Right. Okay, well, never, it doesn't matter. That. But, um, <laughs> but that's what I mean. It's a sort of, you know, I can imagine a diet where some juice is okay too, you know, <laughs> and so is some milk. And so this is where I'm like, what are we arguing about? I don't actually know. Um, and, and how things just kind of fall on these party lines when you start to regulate stuff. And it's like, I don't actually know if we're getting to a better solution at all here. Mm -hmm. Where, what have you, what have you done in terms of looking at, um, I think what really w was interesting about me was this just got me thinking about like, what are the, what is the process by which food gets into a school? Mm. What, like, I know there are, you know, again, call them regulations, call them rules, whatever you want to call them. Like, I know they're, they exist. I know that they're supposed to be X, Y, and mm. Z, but have you ever done any, you know, research or looking into exactly how that's all come to be and what it, what it actually ends up, um, what the result of whatever regulations, whatever rules, um, are? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, they have to follow the USDA guidelines, which is why those become so important because people look to those of like, what's a healthy diet. And so schools are going to follow those recommendations. But then I think kind of the trickle down is, okay, well, what do they consider a dairy source? Mm. And, you know, maybe they consider chocolate milk a dairy source. And so some people are probably going to have an opinion about whether or not that should be considered a daily dairy source because of the added sugar or the chocolate or whatever. And then some people will say that the USDA guidelines, you know, are incorrect or that we shouldn't be having meat because they don't want to eat meat. And so off we go. Right. But my understanding is that they're going to take these guidelines, look at what would count for each of the different components. Like you're supposed to have this many from the dairy group and you're supposed to have this many from the fruit and vegetable group. And then you're supposed to have those type of options available such that people can have a well-balanced diet when eating at the school. Right mm -hmm. now, of course, everything is interesting in application when you try to regulate, because I'm sure there's, you know, this is where fruit juice, I think falls under fruit. And I don't know that they're exact equivalents, right. you know, chocolate milk is milk. I'm not against it, but it's also like, I don't know that everybody needs to drink only chocolate milk for, you know, their dairy. Yep. <laughs> um, but that's, I think really what's happening is again, they're trying to follow the guidelines, what follows, what fits into their different categories. And then those are the foods that you see available. Yeah. Yeah. Have we talked very much about 
uh, again, just back to that word of regulation, especially especially as it relates to nutrition and kind of government regulation over um, over what we can. It sounds weird to say, but like what we can eat and can't eat. Like we've talked about raw milk before, but I guess my my question is, is like where do you come down on the efficacy of a chocolate milk ban? If we just like think about yeah. it, kind of just like broadly speaking, is that whether you agree with chocolate milk should be in a school or not, like the, the, the thought of like, well, it needs to be, uh, the government banning chocolate milk. Like that's the solution. Mm. Or is there another solution that in your mind would be at least equally as effective as it relates to what should be the conversation, which is like, are the kids healthier? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's a really, I mean, I think some of these issues, it's easy to be thinking, well, of course it shouldn't be chocolate milk because of sugar or whatever the yeah, hard stance yeah. is. And then you think about it, how many millions of children, you know, are getting fed by this school system and how are you going to do this in a way that works for a system to feed this many individuals? And I, one of the things that the article I think brought up that I thought was really interesting point is waste. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to look and see what the kids are actually eating team. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's a nice idea that we're going to just put out poached salmon and kale, but <laughs> if yeah. you end up putting all of that in the trash, that's not going to work either. Right. Yeah. yeah. You got a bunch of trash and a bunch of hungry kids. Right. Right. So this is where the chocolate milk is interesting. I, I can see a very good point that if this is how we get some vitamin D and some vit you know, vitamin yeah. A and some protein, okay, we're going to go that way. Right. But so, yeah, I, I think it's just a really tough situation. I completely sympathize with trying to create a mass food production, minimal waste, maximum health in a modern food environment mm -hmm. <laughs> where people are expecting, you know, Twinkies and I don't know whatever else that they want to be eating. Yep. So I think it's a really, really difficult problem. And I perfectly honest, I'm glad that I'm not trying to solve it because I don't, mm -hmm. I don't have the answer. I think it's really hard. I think it's very easy in concept to say, well, it all should be paleo X. Okay. Now you have to deal with the fact that kids aren't eating that. So now what? Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's, that is a really good point. Yeah. Cause uh, believe me, you, a hungry kid is, I just, mm. I'd rather he have a little chocolate milk mm -hmm. with that. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Or she, right. Yeah. I get that. Cool. Anything else on this, uh, on this banning of chocolate milk worth, worth mentioning, or that kind of popped out at you? No, uh, well, I mean, no, but now I'm going to talk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but here we go. I think I think that's just what's really hard. I mean, again, kind of the general concept of regulation in that I think oftentimes things start out with a good intent. You know, maybe the chocolate milk, again, I don't know why it was banned, but maybe it came from the idea that, okay, I'd rather have plain milk or something yep. because of the sugar. Sometimes I think a lot of these regulations start from a good place. But when you get down to the brass tacks and have to look at how this is going to be implemented on a yes, no decision tree, which is not how a diet works, it just falls apart in terms of efficacy. Mm -hmm. All right, our third one, and I was joking before we hit record that we, both of these, the last two are very government related, not at all <laughs> intentional. It's just like, these are the things that were, curi were most curious to me. Um, and so this is called uh, How Wonder Bread Helped Eliminate uh, two diseases in the U.S. And I'm just going to read a brief bit. Although we now know Wonder Bread may pose more health risks than benefits, there was a time when it helped cure disease. During World War II, the company partnered with the U.S. government to start using enriched flour in its products. Uh, this flour to, uh, to which essential vitamins and nutrients were added was much needed at the time because many Americans were suffering from pellagra, P-E-L-L-A-G-R-A, -E pellagra, uh -huh. from a uh, lack of niacin. And then as you might imagine, stuffing essential vitamins and minerals into the sweet pillowy bread didn't do wonders for its taste. Oh, that's clever. I didn't even realize that. Uh, consumers told uh, Chicago Magazine that fortified Wonder Bread seemed limp and inedible, but it got a refresh in the 50s that made it more palatable. Although not too many people today eat Wonder Bread for its nutrients, in its heyday, it helped pull the country out of an epidemic and a war. Wondrous bread indeed. I don't really even know if I have a question about this. I just yeah. thought this was fascinating <laughs> and, and was curious what you thought about it. Yeah, I mean... This is where we actually get some of our quality nutrients. I always say quality to mean kind of vitamins, minerals, and even fiber, but vitamins and minerals prim primarily from processed food. A lot of mm -hmm. things have been fortified because this is the way that we can prevent mass deficiency. Um, you know, iodine is a great example, iodized yeah. salt. And yep. in fact, now with all this revolution of kind of the Himalayan sea salt without iodine, you know, we actually have to start worrying about iodine deficiency again. Oh, that's like, fascinating. Guys, yeah. guys, we fix this problem. You know, we fix this. Um, so that's sort of uh, an interesting side bit there. Yep. 
but yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, uh, easy to forget that some of the stuff that's actually happened with modernization has been a good thing that mm -hmm. we've prevented, like, again, mass nutrient deficiency via some of our food supply. And you could say, okay, well, we all should be eating, you know, whole unprocessed foods to do it. Okay. Well, it's not happening. So now let's actually, you know, address the health issue and help people out. And that's what fortification has done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, one of the things that you always mention where it's appropriate is this, you know, this, this, um, uh, um, just this notion that like government isn't like out to get you, mm. you know, medicine is not the devil. Right. Like, right. It's this, this concept of like, just like all natural all the time is not always the answer. Yeah. Right. And so to me, when I read this, I just think, you know, whether it's appropriate today, that's a different, but like, to me, that that's that that's what, what a wonderful solution to a, a probably otherwise impossible uh, problem to totally. to be able to solve. Totally. I mean, I was watching some uh, YouTube documentaries about some travel in the third world, and some of what you know you can donate to on some of these channels is basically these vitamin packs for children that are basically peanut butter, but they've fortified them with I think it's mm. the vitamin A in this case, um, but it's like essential. It's essential. It's a way to get entire generations so that they don't have mass starvation or, you know, whatever deficiency. And so it's the same sort of thing. It's basically like doing multivitamins in ways that we can disperse the food. Um, yeah. and so, yeah, I mean, it's also funny that, you know, even today, if people think, you know, wonder bread is so bad, it's like, well, let's compare a couple slices to, I don't know, the favorite cookie at your local mm -hmm. bakery or, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, whatever other treat that you're having in your diet, I'm sure we can find a lot worse things in terms of like caloric density that we're taking in that it's so easy to just be like, oh, this is just too processed. You know, it's so terrible. It's like, well, it's probably not that bad relative to a lot of us what are eating. And it was a way to deliver again, the vitamins that we needed. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's just a, such a good reminder of what, you know, you talk about what we talk about here all the time of, of not falling victim to the black and white thinking that is so easy to fall victim to. And I, I don't know if it's because, you know, there's so much noise out there that it's just a lot easier to just sort of like find your camp and just like, I'm never leaving this camp. It's like whole foods are bust, right? right. Or, <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever the other camps may be. Um, and it's where the truth is always far hmm. more I don't even, I don't want to call it complicated. It's just more nuanced. It's mm -hmm. like, you, it doesn't, it's just not going to be as simple as you'd like it to be. No. And just like, and just recognizing that, that, um, that the truth is always going to require a little bit more effort. If you actually want to find it, mm -hmm. if you actually want to understand something, it's going to require a little bit more effort than following somebody on Instagram and reading a couple headlines. Totally. And uh, gosh, coming back to the first one that we talked about, I mean, what are we really after? We're after improving health, right? So if we have to do that by way of fortifying foods that people are eating, that is the method. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if we don't have widespread whole food adoption, okay, we got to go another way. And so it actually is just problem solving. It's, it's not, you know, let me stick to my way because I believe in this one way. Yeah. Um, last question. Is there, do you have any sense of like, this was in World War II? I think mm. the iodine and the salt I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember when that was, was that roughly around the same time period? I don't actually know when they started okay. doing iodine salt. Yeah. Um, I remember, I wish I remembered, uh, uh, there was a really good, I listened to a really good podcast on the whole story of mm. that process. It was, I, I don't remember it. Um, I guess, but my question is, do you have any sense of like, is this still being done? Is mm. this a, is this something that is, uh, still a solution that is used or do we have a, or do you have a sense that like, Oh no, this was a very special time and a very special scenario that this was kind of, they had to do that. Well, foods are still for sure being fortified. I mean, you can look on anything and it's going to yeah. have right. Different vitamins and minerals that have been fortified. A lot of our processed foods have. And so I think there's just a matter of, again, the government looking at where we have clear nutrient deficiencies yeah. where there could be more fortification in what food supplies so that we can avoid any sort of, again, mass deficiencies just by way of the foods that we're currently eating. Yeah. So I, I think it's constantly ongoing and just looking at, you know, what are people eating? What are the nutrients in what they're eating and where do we kind of have to shore up the diet? Love it. All right. 
I'm in the mood for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich <laughs> on uh, Wonder Bread and a glass of chocolate milk now. There you go. Thank you for that. All right. Thank you, EC. Thank you right there for listening. Thank you for your ratings and your reviews. If you've got a, an article or a thing on the internet that you would like us to talk about in the future hotcakes, find me on Instagram. Uh, drop me a DM. P.S. Cummings. I'll add it to our list. EC and I will see you next week for another episode of The Consistency Project. <laughs>